Folks, on September 21st, 2024, the day that this video goes out, I am turning 30 years old. 30 years old. And as is customary when you're approaching a big birthday milestone, I have been doing a lot of introspection, a lot of reflection on my life and asking myself, what do I know at 30 that I didn't know at 20? And so today I just wanted to share with you guys a few of those nuggets in hopes that maybe it'll help somebody out there um, because I came up with five things and fair warning, some of them will ruffle some feathers. So trigger warning to you guys out there. We're going to get a little bit controversial with a couple of these. Just uh, going to consult my little teleprompter here. Um, I actually was looking back four years ago. I made a very video very similar to this when I was in my first year of full-time reselling. I plopped myself down in my Prius and was just talking about some birthday thoughts. And one of the things that I said was, I had a new goal of one day getting invited to an in-person event to speak. And I just was grinning to myself as I was watching that earlier today because um, at this point, I probably hosted a panel at maybe like 12 or so video game conventions. And I've also hosted two 300 plus person reseller events where I've spoken at as well. And I was just smiling at how 26 year old Caleb never could have predicted that. Um, and my first learning of this last decade that I wanted to share with you guys was just the deep level of satisfaction that comes with being seen as an expert in your field. Um, I had an experience earlier this year, actually, where a former pastor hit me up and was like, hey, uh, bro, I recently had um, a death in the family and I inherited all of this stuff and was just wondering if I could maybe buy you some coffee and pick your brain on you know, how to go about flipping this, should I do Facebook Marketplace, eBay, what are the pros and cons? And I just sat back and was like, man, for our entire relationship, the only one ever asking to get coffee to get advice was me of him. And now because of this thing that I do, you know, fairly publicly, and because I've put five years into honing this craft, other people are asking me for that. And I didn't anticipate in my 20s, the level of richness that that would bring to my life and the level of just soul level satisfaction that I would have from it. So I say that not as a humble brag, although I do love to do that. And thankfully this entire video is dedicated to my favorite topic, which is me. Uh, I say that just to encourage anybody who might be out there who's early in their career, that that's an additional thing to look forward to in addition to you know, the the financial side, right? And maybe the lifestyle freedom that you might get from various pursuits. It's something I didn't expect, but that is a deeply joyful part of my life at this point. Now, I think another custom that comes with hitting a new decade is contemplating your mortality and realizing that, boy, uh, the time that I have left on this earth is not infinite. And as I have been wrestling with that a little bit more, I'm thinking a lot about how I'm going to look back on this period of my life on my deathbed. And I just know in my bones at 30 years old that what I am proudest of is not going to be the numbers. Not gonna to be top line, not gonna be bottom line, revenue, gross, whatever. I will not care. What I'm going to care about is how I did it. And the three core values that we have developed over the course of this business or that we've really observed and just started to write down are, I think, some of the pillars that I'm going to be most proud of. The first one is 1% better. My relentless commitment to looking around every day at the channel, at the business, at 1UP, at our shipping uh, table at our inventory storage system at our orientation of the basement and ask myself what sucks about this and what can I possibly make better a lot of people in YouTube and in business get to a point where they see some success and they get complacent right they stop innovating they just stick with their proven formula and that's something that I've refused to do over the last five years and I think it's probably if I had to point to one single reason why the 
business has grown to now doing over a million a year in revenue in video games and why the channel is still getting really good views, it is that single mentality. And I know when I look back on it, I'm, I'm going to be really proud the longer I'm able to maintain it. Uh, the second value is radical honesty. And the more, I'll tell you one way that that's manifested just in the last few months. Because the longer I've been in business, the more I've realized that has just served me so well. In the early stages, it just took the form of like being really transparent on YouTube with like what I'm spending and what I'm making and my biggest struggles in the business and sharing that with everyone. Um, most recently, it took the form of uh, talking to users in our monthly newsletter that we just started sending out for one up in like May or so about all of the features that I'm most discontent with that are going wrong. For the first couple months when 1UP was in beta, we got tons of emails from people saying, dude, scan sucks. Scan doesn't work. I have, I'm have i on this device and it only works half the time or it takes forever to load. Scan was a headache for everyone. And uh, rather than, I, I realized when I started in May, I was like, I can go two directions with this. I can try to downplay it, right? And say like, well, it's working for most people. Sorry about that or whatever. Or I can just be radically honest and say, this is something that I am so bothered by and I am so sorry, like this feature of ours really sucks. And that's the route that I went with and every month I would give updates on how sorry, scan still sucks, but we're working on it. We're trying this thing and I think we might have something in place by this point. And what I realized is the number of people that we had emailing us about how much scan sucks dropped off a cliff. When people realized, oh, this is something that Caleb's more bothered about than anybody, which I was, uh, the level of grace people had for us in that place just shot through the roof. And when we finally were able to fix scan in August, it felt like everyone was partying with us. It was fantastic. Um, so that was just a way that our radical honesty, our policy of radical honesty proved itself again. And I'm absolutely going to take it forward into the future where inevitably we have a bunch more stuff that goes wrong with 1UP. We probably haven't even come across our biggest obstacle yet. I mean, the app is so young, the software is so young. Um, but whatever does come up, I'm going to have the posture of just being super transparent about it and letting people know this is something that sucks. And I hope that it continues to work well. And what's our last value? Um, oh, uh, paying people well, right? Pay your partners is how we say it. Whether it's employees, whether it's uh, contractors or users of 1UP, I just have a policy of paying as much as I possibly like can within reason to still keep the business healthy, to prioritize long-term relationship over short-term gains. And it's worked out so well. We've had such low turnover in the business, which I've been really lucky about. Uh, are really grateful for. Spencer's going to be with us for like three years now. It might already be three years if you count his part-time work. Um, and just being able to retain people for long periods of time, turnover is so expensive in business. And so uh, that policy has served us super well as well. The next thing that I wanted to talk about was a little bit, uh, you know, this is where some people may get a little bit offended. I think for a lot of people, especially business owners, home ownership is a little overrated. I'll let that settle. Some people are already taken to the key. Please don't crucify me because there's a big dogma in the US that um, home ownership is the way, right? It's a part of the American dream. Renting is throwing money away, blah, blah, blah. But for multiple reasons, I don't really agree with that as someone who now has owned two homes. For one reason, in a lot of parts of the country, like it's just more expensive significantly to own than it is to rent. It's not financially feasible to own. And that difference in cost uh, is often much greater than the difference of how much equity you could be putting into the house. And so purely in a financial sense, depending on the part of the country you live in, it might not make as much sense to own. Sorry for saying it. Um, but why I wanted to bring it up here is, I think specifically for business owners, there are a lot of unseen costs that a lot of people don't factor in that I just wanted to bring up as part of my experience. I am super thrilled, I should say, with the fact that we're in this home, especially given the um, like family goals that we have. 30s could be the decade that um, we start having kids, Lord willing. Um, so looking forward to that, obviously, and I'm really happy here. But given that this house is bigger than the last one, it has definitely 
been hitting home just how much it requires, not just financially, because that's another thing that people tend to underestimate is the monthly like trip to Home Depot that you have to make and this improvement and that thing that's broken and this uh, remodeling and that, 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 right? Nothing that you can call a landlord for. It's all just gradually trickling out of your pocket. But for business owners specifically, it's especially expensive because every project that you tackle, every guy that you have to call, whether it's the landscaping guy or the roofing guy or the HVAC guy or the carpet guy or the electrician guy, whatever, that's all effort and management energy that you're putting into the house rather than into your business. Um, and as someone especially whose business is in my house, I'm keenly aware of it. And I think if it was just me and if I was just starting out, I didn't have these family aspirations. Knowing what I know now, I would probably rent. I would rent like some warehouse that has like a loft or something like that. Or failing that, I would just get like a simple apartment and then put most of the money into the warehouse space so that the business has the opportunity to grow. I just wanted to get that out there because the prevailing wisdom is very, very pro home ownership. And I just want to give some people the freedom. If that doesn't make sense for you, it's okay. Enough on that topic because it's only peripherally business related. Here's another one that my perspective has definitely changed on in the last year or so. Uh, well, not year. It's been a gradual process, but having empathy, genuine empathy for the hater. I made a big mistake in the last few years, which was identifying far too much on my channel uh, with countering the hate, right? And it was always in a jokey way. But um, I was often like anticipating objections that people would have, and I had the hater Hank bit and all that. Uh, and unconsciously, what I was doing is I was associating my brand with the haters, right? With being in opposition to something that, you know, stands against me rather than what I truly stand for. And it got to the point where at conventions, oftentimes the first people would, first thing people would say to me, even if I was in a really good place was, hey, keep your head up, man. Don't listen to the haters. And I was like, it made me realize, okay, I have associated myself far too much with this crowd. Uh, and I need to step back from that. And that's why at this point, uh, I pretty much never acknowledge it. This video being a, a notable exception. And I don't read the comments anymore. And I have seen positive results uh, from taking that strategy. But I wanted to also talk about the heart level strategy of like the further distance that I've had from that, the longer I've gone without reading comments and the more removed I've gotten from it, the more I've genuinely been able to find a place in my heart of feeling bad for those people, right? Like having empathy for them and genuinely wanting the best for them. Because happy people who are happy with themselves and happy with their lives, don't leave negative YouTube comments. It's just not something we do. Um, and I'm surprised the longer I'm in business, how much of what I'm learning about business actually comes back to like biblical wisdom in some way, right? Often it's like treating people how you want to be treated, the golden rule. And in this case, it's loving your enemies. Right. And regardless of, you know, what your religious beliefs are and everything, I think there's something to learn in that ancient wisdom for all of us, because uh, I've just found myself in a place of more peace in my heart regarding all of the, you know, opposition, which in reality is a lot smaller than it seems. Right. It's a very small, vocal, loud minority. Um, but boy, I'm in a much better place in 2024 as I'm turning 30 than I was even two years ago on this topic. So I just wanted to share kind of that evolution because I'm planning on spending the rest of my YouTube career kind of coasting in this exact same vein. Not reading comments, not acknowledging publicly like various issues that people could have with my business, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and just trying to find more empathy in my heart for uh, the people who would consider themselves my enemies. The fifth thing that I've learned in this last decade um, is that entrepreneurs, this is something that I heard actually recently, is that uh, business owners were often seen as these like visionary risk takers and these like highly, uh, these highly, not risk averse, but risk prone people. In reality, my day to day, I am much more focused on risk mitigation than risk taking. Like when I am laying awake at night thinking about the business, I'm not thinking about all the great risks that I'm gonna be able to take. I'm thinking about 
all the things that could possibly blow up, right? Amazon shutting us down or YouTube views falling off or competition coming into the market or blah, blah, blah. Um, so I've come to see myself far more as a risk mitigator than a risk taker. And the example that I wanted to talk about specifically on that topic is starting one up because rightfully so, pretty much everyone sees that as a very risky thing. And it was, right? I was betting at the time, I knew at least tens of thousands of dollars on this software that at the time I thought was going to be a price checking software uh, that ended up being a like wholesale software essentially. Um, and everyone saw that as like a really big risk. And it was a big risk, but in my mind, it actually was a risk mitigation play, believe it or not. Because I knew, again, coming back to the deathbed and the mortality, inevitable mortality of man, that I would look back and most likely if I never took that risk at all, I knew there was a 100% chance of me regretting not doing it, right? And not taking that bigger swing that was out of my comfort zone. And so the decision to put all of that money into one up, what has at this point become like $175,000 and counting, was actually primarily motivated not by risk taking, but by risk mitigation. And I think that regret risk is something that most people tend to undervalue. They tend to underestimate, but studies have shown that the vast majority of things that people state as regrets when they are late in life are things that they didn't do rather than things that they did. And I wanted to bring that up just as a little bit of a challenge to anyone watching like, what is the thing, the risk that you're scared of taking right now that in reality you know in your heart has 100% risk of resulting in regret if you don't try? That's a big challenge of the video that I hope helps. I don't know who needs to hear that. I definitely needed to hear that 18 months ago, and so I hope it helps someone out there. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is I will ask people in just about every interview video that I do on the main channel of high-level collectibles business owners, do you genuinely recommend this field for other people? People who are just starting out, maybe they're young in their careers, maybe they're making a transition, do you really recommend owning a baseball card store or a vintage toy store or a Pokemon card online shop or whatever? And often people are pretty hesitant in the collectibles world, I've found. Most business owners are like, man, you can, but it is, it's really tough. And I don't think that that's true of businesses across the board. Of course, everything's hard, but I think it's especially unique to collectibles because we have so much competition. Um, and so I wanted to answer that question. Do I genuinely recommend this industry for both YouTube and for reselling? And the biggest thing that I think about when I answer this question is how the, there is an inverse correlation between the romanticization, right? The glamour factor of any given industry and your odds of success. So to put that in perspective, the more commonly romanticized a career path is, the lower your odds are of success. The lower your odds of success are going to be. Take for example, being an actor. There was some crazy stat that I heard that was like 80% of Screen Actors Guild actors are like below the poverty line because it's so hard to make it in that industry. I think YouTube is similar to that and it's also different. It's extremely highly romanticized and your chances of success are incredibly low, but the advantage that YouTube has over any other industry is dipping your toe in is as easy as it could possibly be. You can whip out your phone and start making videos for literally zero cost except for your time. And I think that's a huge luxury that if you have it in your mind that like maybe I wanna be a YouTuber or start YouTube, you should absolutely at least make five, 10 crappy videos and see how you like it. And if you love the process, then keep making videos and you'll be able to enjoy it regardless of the financial outcome. That's the advice that I give to people on the YouTube side. Understand that your odds of success are worse than becoming an NFL player, statistically, right? Like the number of channels that see a high level, like that million plus subscriber level of distribution is very small. Now that said, the more niche your content is, the higher your likelihood of success. Um, and especially like if you're doing YouTube to build some other business, 
you also have high likelihood of success because like maybe you're a, a real estate broker and you're you know doing a channel based on real estate and you don't actually need views you just need one right view for someone to buy an additional house that's another great reason to start but i digress take all of that into account if you're considering starting a channel one the classic business advice is just start because especially with youtube you don't need any capital you don't need anything you just need your phone um, but understand that it's an incredibly crowded industry and your odds of success are really low. And if I was counseling someone like in high school, I would say like focus on industries as much as possible that are very low glamour factor because you're going to have extremely high chance of success. For example, the trades is the example that people always use. And the value of those degrees is just going up and up as the cost of traditional college goes up and up. Anyways, <laughs> I'm on a tangent now, but the other thing... The other way that I wanted to answer that question is, Caleb, in 2024, do you genuinely recommend becoming a reseller? And to that, I would say absolutely. Like, especially if you're in America, we have a stuff problem. So there's going to be continue to be all kinds of opportunities within this industry. Personally, if I were starting from scratch, I would not go into video games again. I would pick the least sexy, the least romanticized niche that I possibly could. For example, uh, like hardware, you know, screws and nuts and bolts and hinges and drawer handles and things like that. Or gosh, what would another one be like, I almost want to say car parts, but there are a lot of people that are really into cars, maybe like tractor parts, you know, or like agricultural equipment parts, something like that, that nobody's like, mommy, I want to do that when I grow up. I absolutely would get into a niche like that because you're going to have so much less competition. It's going to be way easier to be the guy in your state when somebody wants to sell used tractor equipment or when somebody has a whole bunch of door hinges that they need to unload. Um, that would be my advice for anyone else getting into resale. But folks, I can genuinely say that these last five years of owning these biz this business has... Uh, it's truly been some of the best years of my life. And I cannot thank you guys enough for just believing in me.